Bible tours at the Museum of the Bible. I used I used to uh, work at the Museum of the Bible, but I don't anymore. I worked for three and a half years at the museum. I don't work here now, but I'm just doing a tour on my own with people. I, mean, I gave 650 tours at the museum um, in a year and a half when it was open. And uh, so we're gonna be going through about an hour and a half to two hours total. And I'm gonna be talking really fast. I'm talking slow right now. And the reason I talk fast is because your brain can list about 500 words per minute. And if people talk about 150 words per minute, you get bored and then you have to think about other things and you daydream and you do something else. And um, I had ladies that said, my, my husband has ADD and he doesn't listen to anybody for five minutes. He's listened to you for two hours in this tour. And he says it's the best thing that he's ever done because you keep your brain moving. So remember, just skim the highlights of this. There's nine eight hour days worth of content, 72 hours worth of content. And we're just gonna skim the top 1.2% of the entire museum. There are three main themes in the museum. There's three main floors into the museum and there's three themes to each floor. So it's like a trinity of trinities. We're gonna start here on the outside with the three main themes. They all have Bible verses attached to them. Then we're gonna to go to the three main floors and then we're gonna to go to the three themes on each floor. The impact floor is asking the question, is the Bible good? We go through the impact of the Bible in America, the impact of the Bible in the world, and then the impact of the Bible now. Then we go to the story floor saying, hey, what is the Bible? A lot of people come to the museum of the Bible, they don't know what the Bible is. So we explain the Hebrew Bible walkthrough or Old Testament walkthrough. It's a 30 minute walk through the Old Testament. We won't go on that today, we won't have time. The New Testament theater, we'll try to get to that. I got to that yesterday on the Zoom tour. It's an 11 minute overview of the New Testament from John's perspective, the youngest apostle and the last apostle. And then we'll also go to the world of Jesus of Nazareth. It's a first century replica of Nazareth with historical interpreters talking to you as if they're in Nazareth. And I'll walk you through that. We'll go into a mikvah, we'll go into a synagogue. We'll see the parables of Jesus, the overview of Galilee. We'll go into the olive press and a home, a replica of a home in first century. And then we'll go to the last floor, which is the history floor saying, hey, prove it to me. Show me the artifacts, show me the proof. Can you show, show, show it to me? Can you prove it to me? And we'll have that. Dave Stotts drives us around in a Jeep and a couple of cool cars to show you all the places where the Bible's written throughout the world. And then we go from 3000 BC to the modern age, all the history of the Bible. And then we crescendo with what's called illuminations or Bible translation. If we do have time, I'll take you up to the uh, fifth floor where you will see the second period uh, temple stone the Herodian temple, that's the temple that Jesus walked into. We have a stone from that temple, the temple that Jesus walked into in 33 AD. You can touch that stone if you're here um, and I'll touch it for you uh, better on Zoom. And then also we'll probably get up to the last floor, the sixth floor, so you can see the overview of the Capitol. But what I'm gonna start right now is with how the museum got founded and started. So um, I'm gonna talk really fast, it's by design, so we keep it moving and everything. In 1933, in 1933, this build, uh, 1923, I'm sorry, this building was built as a refrigerated warehouse. A train would pull off that track right there, and there was a spur that came into the building. It would come 10 feet off the ground into this 40-foot opening and go all the way to the other side of the museum where it would dump off meat in a 10-foot meat locker. So this was a refrigerated warehouse. In the 50s, the Kennedy family ended up buying the building and turned it into the Merchandise Mart, kind of like the Chicago Mart or the Atlanta Mart. There's marts before the internet where people would come and buy things wholesale and then sell them retail. And those were marts, uh, but uh, this was the Washington Design Center, kind of like a mart like that. And then in 2012, we purchased the building and we said, what do you do with a 40 foot opening? As you can see right here, there's a 40 foot opening. And they said, make it iconic, put something on the outside. It's the largest opening of any museum in Washington, D.C. So we put the Gutenberg Bible, first edition, Genesis 1, the print bed. That's Genesis 1, the print bed. So in a print bed, your right becomes your left when you print down. So Genesis 1-1 is in the upper right-hand corner, right up here. If you count six lines down, if you were here, you could see this. Count six lines down. The first uh, uh, word, second word in is a backwards F. That's the Latin phrase for let there be light. And that's the first time God ever spoke in the Bible. He says, let there be light, Genesis 1-3. So that's the first theme of the museum of the Bible is light. That theme of light runs throughout the entire museum. You're going to see Tunisian tile that is dark and turns to light because as you read the Bible, you're illuminated. You get more light. That's the first theme. And God said, let there be light. The second theme is woven pomegranate branches, leaves, and trees. You can see we took a little bit of artistic license on the Gutenberg Bible is not a marginalia, but we put marginalia out there or, or woven pomegranate branches, leaves, and trees because you know all the verses. John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches, you're engrafted the vine. And Jesus, you're engrafted in him for your atonement. But that right there, that theme runs throughout the entire museum. So that's the second theme. The third theme is right in front of your eyes. It's 40 feet of glass. It's called the Bomber Papyrus. Now, in real life, the Bomber Papyrus is about six inches, six inches wide, about maybe 12 inches high. And the Bomber Papyrus is the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew. That is Psalm 19, the whole chapter. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows the handiwork. So everything in the world declares the glory of God. Now, it's in Greek, as you can see on this glass, but it's also in four panes, four panes, four panes, four panes, 16 more languages 
all sang Psalm 19, external language, Mandarin, French, German, English, Spanish, Arabic, all these Korean, Hindi, all these languages so that anyone that comes to the Museum of the Bible, the major uh, uh, languages of the world can see, people that read, uh, can read those languages can see everything in the world declares the glory of God. So remember, God said, let there be light. Woven pomegranate branches, leaves, and trees. So Genesis 1 3, John 15 5, and then Psalm 19. Everything in the world declares the glory of God. And you'll see right there, folks, everything in this building will declare the glory of God. You'll walk out of here seeing the glory of God in so many different ways, but we'll do that. Normally, what I do is I have you, if you're here, stand on this, and we'll take a picture of you. So somebody give me your phone, so, so and I can give it to you, you guys at the, you can uh, airdrop it to each other at the end. Just go right up there, and um, I'll take a picture of you guys. So I'm going to take a picture of the people that are here. It's asking you for face ID. Let's see. Yep, so I'm going to take a picture of everybody that's on this tour of these people so you can see because I uh, I want them to be able to share on social media um, the best pictures. They pull in just a little bit, share the best pictures here so they can share with their people about what's going on at Museum of the Bible. So here we go. One, two, and three. One, two, and three. One, two, and three. And one, two, and three. We're just, so we'll figure out which one's best there. I just want to think of a couple. So we'll right here. Go into the left right there. You're going to go through the magnetometers. And uh, just walk right in here, everybody. Go take your temperature real quickly and meet me inside, um, and we'll continue to keep the tour going. Hey, Ryan. So are on Zoom. Yep. Uh -huh. Just uh, double check your earpiece because the, the audio is kind of going from low to high quality. Okay. I got this on for a tour, so I just want to make sure. Yeah, there we go. Straight out like a tea. Thank you. Something in your pocket. That's a key. Turn around to the back. As you can see, folks, we're doing a legitimate tour. We're even going through security virtually. She's too sorry. Thank you. So, everybody, um, just going through the magnetometers there. Can you hear me, Brent? Yeah, I, we can hear you. Good. Okay, hold on just for a second. I'm uh, getting through here. I'm getting the people that are going through the magnetometers, and I'll start talking to you guys again. So there's a group down here where I normally start off everything, and we'll try to work around them. So, Brent, can you see now? Uh, your fingers over the camera, it looks like. Uh, uh, sir, I'm going to be doing a tour here just for about two minutes. Uh, can I, uh, some people are going to be coming. Somebody talking for about two minutes right here. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. So, uh, remember the first theme God said, let there be light, Genesis 1 3. Here's Tunisian tile, which is dark, and it goes from dark to light. Uh, Brent, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Right. Okay, it goes from Tunisian tile, goes from dark to light. As you walk into the Bible or read about the Bible, you pass from darkness into light. The second theme is right here, woven pomegranate branches, leaves, and trees. As you can see right there, that's where that motif starts, and that runs throughout the entire museum. And then we have Jerusalem stone, which is imported from Israel, with uh, hope through the comfort of the scriptures, which is one of the main themes of the Museum of the Bible. Psalm 119, 105, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, is up there in a second. Here's the back side of that bottom of papyrus that I talked about with the Greek lettering in the 16 different languages. So everybody that worked in the museum is right over here. 6,000 people that worked on the museum. Clark Construction Team is 3,000. Smith Group is like 100 people for the architects. Um, Zayner, the front doors, is like 100 people. Everybody that worked in the museum, board of directors, leadership, and then uh, associates and employees. But what I'm going to do is go right past here because we have a big, there's a big group of students here. We're going to go right in here so we can see, so we can see the uh, digital theater, digital ceiling. So folks, what I just did is just said, that's where the um, Tunisian tile is completely dark and it goes from dark to light. So that's the theme, let there be light. And then the woven pond and branches, leaves and trees are right here on this uh, second floor up here. And then the Jerusalem stone on the side is imported from Israel and it has Bible engraved all over. But this is a 140 foot long, 15 foot wide, horizontally mounted monitor. The largest in the United States that we know of. There's bigger ones vertically, like the Dallas, Texas football stadium. Come around here, come around here so you can hear me. Bigger ones vertically, like the Dallas Texas Football Stadium or the Marriott Marquis in Times Square, but this is a horizontally mounted monitor. 
So we, we could sleep 300 kids a night under this in their sleeping bags. And I did that with a um, kind of like a um, Boy Scout cut type troop. 300 kids slept out here and we could show movies. We show Pure Flix movies on these screens at night so they can see kind of like a night at the museum if you've ever seen that movie, but a lot different. I got that idea from the American Museum of Natural History in Washington, in uh, New York City. They sleep 300 kids a night under this big blue plastic whale. And we have way, way better than a big blue plastic whale because this screen can flip out or have movies or whatever. So that shows you a little bit about well, what's going on, as you can see, it keeps flipping out, flipping out, flipping out. Now, 53,000 donors raised $620 million of a $1 billion project. The building alone costs $509 million, and the artifacts are about another $500 million. We take $0 from the government. When I say we, folks, I just, I, I so ingrained in my mind, I say we. It's the Museum of the Bible. I don't work there. But if I say we, just go with it because uh, and understand what I'm talking about. So uh, we, $0 from the government. So all the Smithsonian's. Uh, your tax dollars pay for the for those museums, but this is a private museum, so we take zero government funds. So keep walking this way, and we'll show you what's actually going on in the museum. So as you can see, the uh, digital ceiling is flipping out different um, scenes. Um, that was a ceiling right there. So this is a, a bunch of uh, trees, as you can see, and the t t tile, as you can see, is getting lighter and lighter and lighter um, as we walk into the museum. Um, and the Bible is. Um, um, uh, being illuminated to you. So if uh, right over here on the left side um, is actually everything that goes on in the Museum of the Bible. So we show you on these digital screens of what's going on in the Museum of the Bible, like the stories of the Bible, the different floors of the Bible and things like that. Now, right over here, um, I'm gonna go, it's, it's not going on right now, but there used to be a virtual reality tour right in that room right there, uh, virtual reality goggles. You would have 16 places in Israel where you'd be able to see all in Israel about what was going on. So you'd be in a virtual reality world and uh, so we want to walk you around Israel so you can, we can immerse you in the Bible. There, there's uh, three main things to ways that people learn. People learn by visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. So we want you to see some with your eyes, hear some with your ears, and do some with your body, your hands, because we can know that you will learn better if you see some with your eyes, hear some of your uh, ears, and do some with your body. Going to your church and listening to a sermon is awesome, and I think you should do that. But at the same time, if you can engage your body, if you can do something outside of that even more, you learn in a, a different way. This is the Vatican Museum and Library. We teamed with the Vatican Museum and Library to bring things to the world that have never been seen before. Monsieur Pocini and Barbara Giotta. Um, I worked with them on some of the things that we had here uh, back in the day. So this is um, now the three main donor walls. There is the Million Names wall. It's on the sixth floor. If you gave a dollar more to the museum, your name is in micro calligraphy. Remember the second theme? Woven pomegranate branches, leaves, and trees. I'm the vine, you're the branches. It's micro calligraphy. Your name is in micro calligraphy, and it's woven together in woven pomegranate branches, leaves, and trees on the sixth floor. Anybody that gave a dollar or more to the museum. Right over here is the wall of gratitude. These are $50,000 gifts to a quarter million dollars. Everything from churches, family foundations, people, um, businesses, and stuff like that. And right up here is the wall of stones. That's a quarter million dollar gifts and above. Um, everything from um, you know family foundations and churches, and things like that. Now, this is the grand staircase. The Grand Staircase, we actually won architectural awards for the design of the building, as you can see. Uh, beautiful. There's no weight supporting on this side. Those beams are just stabilizing beams. Those beams stabilize the, uh, the floors, but as you can see, the floors are literally not supported by any weight. And that's eight floors up uh, of, of um, um, it's called a floating staircase. So that's a great picture, too, if you want to take that picture, you get it here. Now, this is the children's experience. Now, it's closed right now, but the children's experience is actually um, we engage, engage children, got getting them to see some of their eyes, hear some of their ears and do some of their body or hands. You can walk into there, it's closed right now, but you can walk in there and you can be Samson and push this wall apart and break down the walls. Or you can throw, uh, or you can walk in Noah's Ark, or you can um, fish uh, with Peter, or you can walk on water like Peter, or you can throw a stone at Goliath um, like David did. There's all sorts of things to engage people um, with the Bible in unique ways like children, because we know that children see some of their eyes, hear some of their ears and do some of their body or hands. And we're gonna get you adults to do that too, but here's what we do. So there's the beauty one last time. We'll go over here to the uh, elevators. The elevators um, in this museum are kind of interesting. They have uh, screens in them so that you can actually see what's actually going on inside the elevators. Now we won't go in the elevator because I think a Zoom won't make it and would be shut off, but I'll come up here to an elevator so you can see actually what's inside the elevator. So you can see right here, this is the uh, traditional part of Mount Sinai right there. Also, there's Mount Arbel from the top of Mount, Mount Arbel looking into the Sea of Galilee. And there's also Herodian where Her Herod is buried. So there's different scenes from different places in the museum Bible. So we'll just let that close and we'll walk up the staircase to the second floor.
So as you walk up the staircase to the second floor, you'll see, remember, there's three main themes uh, of Museum of the Bible. God said, let there be light, woven pomegranate branches, leaves, and trees, and um, everything in the world declaring the glory of God. That's uh, Genesis 1-3, that's uh, John 15-5, and that's um, Psalm 19-1, or the whole chapter of Psalm 19. So now we're going to go to the, so that's the three main themes. Now we're going to go to the three main floors, the impact floor first, the story floor second, the history floor third. The story, uh, the impact floor starts with uh, the impact of what's going on with Jesus being resurrected. So um, there's the three crosses over there, the tomb and the resurrection. Um, this is actually called Easter morning. So you understand what went on with the resurrection. Now over there, we won't go to it right now. Some of the people that are with me have tickets, but that is a ride. It's called Washington Revelations. It's a simulator ride. It's like a um, simulator where you stand on it, it moves the platform around and makes the sensation of flying. And we fly you to 16 of the over 83 places where the Bible is inscribed on buildings and monuments inside the nation's capital. It's an eight minute ride. It's awesome. Some of you have tickets for that. So you can go to that later or anytime that you want to. So right over here, we're going to the impact of the Bible. So the impact of the Bible, remember the impact of the Bible in America, the impact of the Bible in the world, and the impact of the Bible right now. Those are the three parts to the impact floor. So the impact of the Bible is saying, look, first you have to explain the Bible has impact. Because if it doesn't have impact, who cares about the history or who cares about the story? We're going to show you the impact first. After you know that there's impact, and then, you, then people ask, well, what's the story? So we show them the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the world of Jesus and Nazareth. And then the last thing that people in their mind logically go to is, yeah, but is it true? Because if it has impact and it does have a story, but I, but I can't prove it or it's not true, then who cares about it? So that's why we go logically up with what your mind would do. Impact, story, and history. But here's the impact of the Bible. We're going to start right here. So. This is a 254 foot woven tapestry of the entire story of America from 1620 all the way to the 1960s, 254 feet that way, all the way down there. So it's a 254 foot, folks, you're with me, just be aggressive and walk into the spot so you'll hear everything that's said. So 254 feet that way will end in the 1960s, from 1620 to the 1960s, all the story. If you ever get lost, look at the left side, that's the big picture, but I'm gonna go into some of the details. It starts with the November 11th, 1620, the Puritans get off the boat. They sign the Mayflower Compact, talking about their allegiance to God. Off the boat walks William Bradford. That's his silhouette right there, William Bradford. He's the second Plymouth governor. He walks off the boat and he signs the Mayflower Compact, which is right here. The Mayflower Compact, as you can see right here, talks about their allegiance to God, how they were trusting in God and relying on God. They walked off the Mayflower and they had Geneva Bibles in their hand. Now, we actually had the original Geneva Bible that they had with them, but this is a replica of that. They walked off the boat, they had Geneva Bibles in their hands. Now folks, that's proving the Bible's impact on America. Before it was even a country, they walked off the Mayflower and William Bradford and the others had Geneva Bibles in their hand on the ship with them. And so when they walked off the boat, they said, we wanna show our allegiance to God, we're gonna make the Mayflower compact. Remember, look to the left if you're confused ever, but I'm gonna give some of the details on the right, right over here. This is the first Bible ever printed in the new world. It's in a Wapanoak dialect, which is the Algonquin tribal dialect. This is called the Elliott Indian Bible. It's the first Bible ever printed in the New World in the Wapanoak language in Algonquin. So they're in, they're not English was not the first printed. Keep coming up, folks, just so you can see. This is where the slave Bible used to be. Now, the slave Bible was given to slaves, and the entire book of Exodus was removed from the Bible. We teamed with Fisk University and the uh, uh, African American Museum in Washington, D.C. to bring the slave Bible to, uh, to the world. The slave Bible was manipulated to uh, not show a lot of Exodus and a lot of things about freedom and bondage and things like that, so slaves wouldn't even know some of the the things that the Bible actually said. Now, you know, what do you do with people when they manipulate a book to say things that it doesn't say or don't say things that it does say? We had that discussion where you could go into the digital world with hashtag slave Bible, or you could write about it in the slave Bible exhibit. But we uh, in, ended that exhibit. But I, I like to talk about that to talk about what do you do when people manipulate the Bible to say things that it didn't say or not say things that it did say? That happens all the time. People take it out of context and everything. You need to take a Bible as a, as a whole. It's, you can't cherry pick different things. You have to take it as a whole. So right here is Judaica and Torah scrolls talking about how the Jewish people impacted the founding of America. And here's the first synagogue in the New World, which is in New Amsterdam in New York City. Hey, Ryan, if you can hear me, we lost audio. Brent, can you hear me? There we go. 
There you go, good. This is the New England Primer. The New England Primer was used as an education book to teach students how to read and write. It was a Bible lesson with Bible characters and Bible verses. And as you can see right here, there are little Bible lessons, Bible characters, and Bible verses on the pages of the New England Primer. That's how they used to teach students how to read and write in the early days of America. Right up here is the founding of Harvard and the founding of Yale. I will quote to you what Thomas Clapp, the rector of Yale, said of why they founded Yale. Quote, to educate young men for the work of the ministry. That's why they founded Yale. And it goes on to say, students were required to study the Bible diligently morning and evening and to adhere to orthodox interpretations of the quote, word of God. Folks, that's why the rector of Yale said why they started Yale. I mean, think about that. I'll just move on from that. We'll not talk about that anymore because you can understand what's really going on. Um, right here is the Bible on the US map. Now folks, now Salem is 139 times. Come on up folks, everyone. 139 times on the U.S. map. It's heavy on the east and light on the west. And Pisgah is 113 times on the United States map. It's heavy on the east and light on the west. And Zion is 108 times on the U.S. map. It's heavy on the east and light on the west. And why do you keep saying, why do you keep saying heavy on the east and light on the west? Because as you can see in the 1700s, 1800s, when the east coast was founded, basically, there was a lot, a lot of Bible, a lot of Bible uh, references to the cities. But as you can see in the west, probably the late, late 1800s, early 1900s, under the West Coast was founded, and there were less Bible names as the as the people in the United States had less, uh, the Bible impacted their lives less. Now, there's four different types of people in the world. There's uh, pragmatics. They want to see the big picture. Just give me all the big picture. Then you have analytics. They want to see all the detail. Um, so they go into detail, 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 detail. Give me all the details. Then you have amiables. They want to hear all the stories that I'm telling. And extroverts, you want to ride all the rides and touch all the things and talk to all the people, because I'm one of you. I like that too. But we want to uh, we designed the museum was designed so that those four different types of people could get something from the museum because I literally watch people spending two hours in these first four cases and after about two hours they are exhausted and they've seen like literally 50 feet of this whole museum and they're just exhausted I'm like I can't stay here anymore I say look skim the museum in one to two hours hit the highlights let the spirit of God talk to you about what he wants you because you might be an amiable or an extrovert or an analytical or a pragmatic, and you're different, and different people on tours will get different things because they'll be talked to differently because they're different people. So just skim the museum, let the things go over your mind and say, God, you know, ask God, God, what do you want me to hear? What do you want me to hear from you? What do you want me to listen to? What do you want me to learn today? And each one of you will get a little bit different, but it's all to you, your mind and your heart. So this is William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania. He's the largest landowner in the history of the world other than a monarch in the United States. He was granted 45,000 square miles by the state in the state of Pennsylvania. Right over here is George Whitfield. In six seconds, you'll see a 10 minute overview of George Whitfield and the first great awakening right there, but we'll go past that because it's so long. And right up here is a replica of the Liberty Bell forged in the original foundry is the original Liberty Bell. And a lot of people know a useless, irrelevant fact that there is a crack on the Liberty Bell and that is irrelevant. What's relevant is right over here, there's actually scripture on the bell. Leviticus 25.10, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Leviticus 25.10, if I stood 10 feet from the Liberty Bell and said to everybody, hey, do you know there's a crack on the bell? Everyone would say, yeah, there's a crack on the bell. If I said, hey, can you quote to me the scripture reference on the bell? Less than 3% of people would even know what I'm talking about. And actually the reason why the bell was designed was to proclaim freedom throughout the land to today to everyone, to the black slave, you have freedom and liberty, to the woman, to women, you have freedom and liberty, to everyone, you have freedom and liberty, you're all equal because the, uh, we were to proclaim liberty throughout all. And that's proving the Bible's impact in America for like the 10th time that I've said it in the last 50 feet with an iconic artifact, the Liberty Bell. That's why it was designed. Right over here, September 10th, 1782, Congress appointed this Bible, the Aiken Bible for the American people. Literally folks, your Congress in 1782, September 10th said, we want the American people to read the Bible. We're gonna appoint this Bible as the Bible for them to read. Never before since has that obviously happened in, in the United States. Right over here is the Aiken New Testament. This is the first time the Bible was ever put into English in America in the New World. That's called the Aiken New Testament. So both these, you can look at those online. And right here, remember, invite all people to engage the Bible. Get them to see some of their eyes, hear some of their ears, and do some of their body. So we provide what's called an audio shower. So when I step in here, you'll start to see the audio rain down. And it's Ben Franklin and Samuel Seabury talking from their original works of why dramatists talking uh, from the original works with Samuel Seabury and, John, and, and Ben Franklin talked about how the Bible impacted the founding of America. It's not quite there, it's just started. So as you'll see then John Adams and George Washington, Benjamin Rush, six founding fathers all saying the exact same thing from their original writings of how the Bible impacted America from their own words. Literally you'll have dramatists quoting up and they'll show the original writings right here and the cases and they'll show them literally talking about how the Bible impacted America. Folks, that literally like is like the 15th time that I've said it in the last hundred feet of how the Bible impacted America. Right over here is the Jefferson Bible. The Jefferson Bible was given every freshman congressman from 1904 to 1950, every freshman congressman was given a Jefferson Bible. 
Now, Jefferson said in his own words, he cut up the Bible to make a book of morality, ethics, and law so that people that are making morality, ethics, and law or law can see what the Bible says about that. Uh, Jefferson also, right after that, had a pastor preach in Statutory Hall, which is in the Capitol. So a lot of people, there's controversy with this. Some people say Jefferson hated the Bible. Some people said he liked the Bible. Normally, I side with what someone come, what comes out of someone's mouth about what they believe rather than listening to someone else about what the person said. So Thomas Jefferson, in his own words, said why he did that. So I normally go, and I know there's controversy about this, but I normally go with what people said. Now, right over here are some original writings from uh, Frederick Douglass and Harry Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And then we talk about William Lloyd Garrison, who had a newspaper and worked with Frederick Douglass until they split up and had their own newspapers. On the backside of these cases are the controversies that surrounded the Bible, pro and anti-slavery, obviously a controversy that people took both sides on, pro and anti-scopes trial, pro and anti-social gospel, pro and anti-debating the authority of American controversies, pro uh, the women in the Bible, social gospel, fundamentalist modernist debates. And as you see right here, we have a divided screen because now we have the civil war and we have a divided screen showing the divided nature. Here's the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. And right here where this belt is used to be a blue velvet Bible given to Abraham Lincoln from a delegation of African American pastors. Now think about this. There was former slaves that scraped together $580 that they obviously didn't have. Uh, to, uh, that's around $8,000 in today's terms to give President Lincoln a Bible. They believed the best way that they could honor the president and show him uh, uh, thankfulness was to give him a Bible because of what he had done for them. That's showing the Bible's impact on America again for like the 15th time that I just said it. Now here's Julia Ward House. Battle Hymn of the Republic. You rem and that's the original that she pinned it on right there. You may have remembered that song, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory of the Coming of the Lord. She pinned it in the Willard Hotel. She wake up, woke up at five in the morning. She pinned it on that document right there. We brought it over to the Willard Hotel and displayed it for about a week. They were ecstatic to have a piece of their history in the Willard Hotel. Now, I will give you joy and light, people. That's the last time that I will sing on this museum. So you Brent, can you hear me? Yeah, I sure can. Just muted you for a second. Okay, everyone, everything was good. Okay, here, Billy Graham and Martin Luther King Jr. Ha, um, uh, did a, a, a evangelistic crusade in Madison Square Garden for about six weeks straight. And Martin Luther King Jr. was staying on stage with Billy Graham's many of those nights because they wanted people of all races and all ethnicities to engage the Bible. And here are some artifacts from uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. And here are some artifacts from Billy Graham's life. We had an exhibit on Billy Graham's life because his family let us use some of the artifacts from his life and um that was going on right after his death about two to three years ago now folks we just went through about eight hours worth of content in about 10 minutes so we gotta literally give you simple concepts one plus one equals two one country 400 years before we move into a bigger concept the bible's impact on the world which is hundreds of countries thousands of years and the reason why we do that is because if one plus one equals two, then you can go on to two times two equals four. Then you can go on to eight divided by four equals two. Then you can go on to geometry and trigonometry. But if you don't know a simple concept, you can't go to the more complex one. That's why we test you right here or survey you so we can see what do you think and know about what we've explained to you in the first 400 years of America right there. And here's the Bible's impact on the world. Everything from so, uh, so, um, human rights with Desmond Tutu, Martin Luther King Jr. and Frederick Douglass, all the way to science with Galileo and his telescope right over there. Sir Isaac Newton right here, and George Washington Carver right here, and modern day scientists like Alistair McGrath and John Lennox and 2D holographs talking to you about how the Bible impacted science. I literally had uh, John Lennox uh, right here about two years ago, and literally we had him stand next to his holograph, and he thought it was so funny to be standing next to his holograph because you kind of couldn't tell the difference, obviously, from the holograph and him if you didn't pay attention to what it was. So he was laughing and thinking that was so funny. But come over here, here's the Bible's impact on government. I had a man, the Prince of Fiji's son, the other day was here, and a man from Lebanon was here, and we were able to show them how the Bible impacted their different respective countries. Um, so Lebanon and uh, the Fiji, you see right here. And right here is uh, Thomas Jefferson writing about John Locke's treatise on the Enlightenment. Now, in his own words, uh, in his own hand, he signed it and penned it with his own name and, 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 signed and uh, wrote this document. Thomas Jefferson says, man should have freedom of conscience to believe what he wants about God, the Bible, and religion, and that civil authority or government should have no right to infringe on that freedom. Now, folks, think about that. That was written to you 210 years ago by a founding father telling you that you have freedoms of uh, what, you, what you believe about God, the Bible, and religion, and nobody should infringe on that. And here we are kind of in the 21st century to even still debating that to this day. Kind of interesting. Now, here's a bunch of different president Bibles, Grover Cleveland's Bible, Jimmy Carter's Bible, uh, uh, the Bush family Bible. And here's the Bible that Donald Trump was sworn into on January 2017 given him at the First Presbyterian Church of Jamaica, Queens, New York, in his primary school Sunday school.
school, school class. This is the Bible received that Donald Trump received upon graduation from that class in 1955. So right over here, we're going to talk about the Bible's impact on work, everything from medicine and law and academia and profession. I had um, a guy on the tour the other day, this guy right here, Terrence, and he was able to, um, um, to see his tour. And we were actually, he was talking about how the Bible impacted his life right here on this thing and when we were touring him the other day. So here's the Bible's impact on compassion ministries like Habitat for Manny, Convoy of Hope, and Compassion International. And here's the Bible's impact on everyday life. Atheist writers say things like, you're going to reap what you sow. And they're literally quoting Galatians 6, 7. They're like, I hate the Bible. And then they say, yeah, you're going to reap what you sow. And I'm like, you literally just quoted the Bible and you said you hated the Bible. I mean, people say things like, there's nothing new under the sun all the time. We're adding fuel to the fire. Or, Pride comes before or fall. Or uh, see, seeing eye to eye. These are all literally quoting the Bible, folks. And these are people that don't even like the Bible or read the Bible. As you can see right here, in more than the modern day example, President Obama talked about my brother's keeper, obviously a clear allusion to Cain and Abel. Right here is Heidi Klum, the model and actress, with a, a, a snake on and an apple. She dressed up in this character. It's a clear allusion to Adam and Eve. And right here is David Beckham's wife with a Hebrew verse on it. I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. Now, Richard Dawkins, the atheist, states in his book, The God Delusion, if you don't have a working knowledge of the Bible, you're basically illiterate in the 21st century because someone would say things like to you, hey, that was a good Samaritan moment. And you'd say, what's a good Samaritan moment? You wouldn't even know what he's talking about. As an example, Tim Tebow put John 316 on his eye patches. The same day that he did that, 31 million people Googled, what is John 316? They didn't even know what he was talking about. Therefore, Richard Dawkins, the atheist, would state they're culturally illiterate. They don't even know what's going on. We could spend literally an hour here, folks, and go through all these things, but I'm just skimming the surface and hitting the highlights of what it is. Hold on for a second. I'm going to make sure that we got that. Yep, there we go. So right here is the Bible's impact. Brent, can you hear me? Brent, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, good. Here's the Bible's impact on the criminal justice system. Now, what you see are, these are pr prisoners from Texas State Prison and Angola State Prison. What you see are statistics prove um, when you go, when you read the Bible while you're in prison, you gauge the Bible while you're in prison, you go back to prison less. It's called the recidivism rate. It actually falls through the floor, 200% decrease in the rate which you go back to prison when you engage the Bible. Now, folks, think about that. If Dr. Seuss, the children's book, or, uh, I mean, why does this happen? Because the Bible teaches love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, faith, meekness, temperance. It teaches these men can be forgiven and forgiven. What does that do? Impacts their life. Now, if Dr. Seuss, the children's book, would literally make people go back to prison less and it could be proved. Why wouldn't we just give them Dr. Seuss? I mean, I'd give them Dr. Seuss. Why? Because it works. Now, uh, I mean, I, I would like to go to government and say, hey, do you want to save $100 million or not? I mean, do you, do you really want people to go back to prison less or not? If you do, why would you block that other than your own bias if the statistics prove it, which they do? Right over here is the Gutenberg Press. In the year 2000, Time Magazine said the top 100 things in the last thousand years, the number one most impactful thing of the last thousand years was the Gutenberg printing of the Bible. It wasn't the Gutenberg Press or wasn't printing. It was the Gutenberg printing of the Bible. Why? Because it was a renaissance of information brought about literature, literacy. Hundreds of thousands of books were produced in a few short years. It was a renaissance of information. Now, right over here are medallions of universities and the schools in those universities. Now, think about this, folks. Literally, UC Berkeley's medallion on UC Berkeley's medallion in their school is Genesis 1-3, let there be light. Ye Yeshiva University, Columbia University, Oxford University, Princeton University, Northwestern University. Do you know Columbia University actually has three mottos of their school are all Bible verses on the medallion of their school? Columbia University, where Barack Obama went to college, literally those things have literally still to this day have Bible verses as the mottos of their school. Now, that's showing the Bible has impact. Now, here is um, the Madonna and Child from the four, fourth century AD, right there, the first one that we know of, all the way down to the modern age. And this is Jesus drinking a Coca-Cola with an Apple iPhone in his hand. Mary has Monopoly pieces and Ronald McDonald and Daffy Duck are in the boat with her. Now, we're not, we're not saying we like or dislike that. We're just saying that proves the Bible has impact because you wouldn't even paint that picture if you didn't even understand that the Bible had impact and what that impact was. Here's the Bible's impact on architecture right here. And here's the Bible's impact on movies, everything from Dan Aykroyd quoting the Bible in Ghostbusters to Halle Berry and, and X-Men quoting the Bible to Prince of Egypt, the DreamWorks uh, uh, um, Pixar movie to Selma to Evan Almighty to Kevin Bacon quoting the Bible in Footloose, literally. Um, right over here is music about the Bible. Kanye West singing about the Bible. Coolio singing about the Bible. The Rolling Stones, Janis Joplin, Bob Marley, Coldplay, Matisse Yahoo, the, the Israeli pop singer singing about the Bible. Did you know Freddie Mercury uh, in the film Bohemian Rhapsody two years ago won an Oscar. Now Freddie Mercury's dead, but Freddie Mercury had a full song called Jesus singing about the Bible and Jesus. Right over here is actually a shirt that you can make. As you see this guy is doing right here, 
I'll step into it when he's done and I can make my own shirt. And I was designing an app where you could actually make your own shirt so you could walk out of the Museum of the Bible with your own shirt that you designed. And um, you could go in and pixelate it and change the thing just like he's doing. And you would be able to change it and freeze the shirt and have your own shirt that you had at the Museum of the Bible. So really cool. And here are two of the largest couture fashion shows in 2014 were biblically themed dresses. Jean-Paul Gaultier, Versace, and Dolce Gabbana. We bought all the dresses. Here are some of them. Here's Katy Perry and the Byzantine collection of the Dolce Gabbana 2014, 2013 runway show right here, showing how the Bible impacts even fashion, something that you wouldn't even think. Here's the Bible's impact on um, uh, literature. Everything from Moby Dick and Shakespeare to uh, Superman and... Um, um, uh, uh, um, Superman and Woman, all shown how the Bible impacts um, literature. Now, right over here is I Am Second. I Am Second, if you've never seen I Am Second before, I Am Second is people sharing their story or their testimony. They're in this white chair. They sit in this white chair, and for about five to 10 minutes, they talk about their story, their testimony. People like uh, just all sorts of people, all sorts of pseudo celebrities, if you will. And, and at the end, they say, my name is like, say, Ryan Smith, and I am second, meaning Jesus is first, and I am second. And that's their story. So they sponsored this area. But this, now we move in. We just saw the Bible's impact in America, the Bible's impact on the world, and the Bible's impact now. This is a 360-degree time lapse from the Tower of David Museum. It's a full day in Jerusalem, showing you everything that's going on in a full day from the Tower of David Museum. You have the Mount of Olives and the city and the Temple Mount and the Western Wall and the Kidron Valley. Normally, it's a full day, and a, so a sunrise starts. There you can see over the Mount of Olives, the sun is coming up. So you see a full day in Jerusalem and you go all throughout this and you see, see cloud coverage and everything that's going on. But that's just a full, so this is the Bible's impact right now. The next scene that will flip out will probably be our graffiti wall. But right over here, I say, how does the Bible make you feel? Remember, we wanna engage people with the Bible to give them to see some of their eyes, hear some of their ears and do some of their bodies. So I say that the Bible makes me feel loved. And I put loved in my favorite color, red. And I hit loved right here and it goes up onto the screen and then it goes up onto our graffiti wall, right? There's my word love. And you can literally have your word loved. And I have kids taking selfies of their words and everything like this. Now, folks, think about this all over the world, what people are saying, how the Bible makes them feel in different languages, even sweet, spiritual, uh, fantastico, holy, alive, bliss, extraordinary, fascinating. It makes them feel hope. It makes them feel epic. It makes them feel true, pleased, wonder, full of wonder. All these things, glory, grand, makes the Bible makes them feel. Now, we'll also um, go over here, and this is U version. 354 million people have downloaded U version on their Apple and Android device. These are just the pings all over the world of U version, what's going on. And you can go country by country on U version, and you can see country by country. So, in the country of Afghanistan, what is the most shared verse in Afghanistan today by U version's data? The most shared verse in Afghanistan is John 1930. When he had received the drink, Jesus says, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, folks, think about that. In, in Afghanistan today, people were sharing that verse more than any other verse in Afghanistan. So you can see the Bible has impact all over the world. And literally, you can team with your uh, family and friends, and you all can link together on U version, download U version, link together as your network. And then when you're um, reading your devotions in the morning, you're highlighting verses so people that you know and people that, that they know can see what you encourage you about the Bible day by day. Now, folks, here are the uh, I Am Second Joshua Machine. Now, here's the, probably the one of the most important things I think in the whole Museum of the Bible, the Joshua Machine. You go into this book, you go into this uh, booth for two minutes, you talk about the Bible and back to your life. Now, the problem is, is all your family's not here. So what you got to do is you got to take out your iPhone and you got to say, hey, to your family, I'm going to videotape you about how the Bible impacts your life. Tell me how the Bible impacts your life. Go. Tell me how the Bible impacts your life. Tell me how the Bible impacts your life. Tell me how the Bible impacts your life. Now you have 20 or 30 videos in your iPhone, and you can go onto Google Drive or Dropbox to save them to your family. If you don't know what I just said right there, just email them to your family. The point is, is everybody in your family will have video testimonies of how the Bible impacted their life. Now we're going to pause right here for a second, because this is what's on Facebook, YouTube, um, uh, Instagram, all these different things about how the Bible is impacting right now on literally the internet. So you can see, here's Wycliffe Bible Translators talking. Here's the Bible Society of North Ireland. Here's NIV talking. Here's Wycliffe UK talking. Here's United Bible Societies. Here's Canadian Societies. Here's different people all over the world talking about how the Bible is impacting the world right now. And you can just read them. If you are angry, you cannot do any of the good things that God wants you wants done, James 1.20. And then they share Galatians 5. God is the one who makes all things possible. He has given us his spirit to make us certain he will do 
but he will do it. Second Corinthians 5, 5. So they're just sharing for the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with angels. So they're just sharing all throughout. Now I'm going to come back to this story. Remember you take your phone and you videotape and you say, how does the Bible impact your life? Now you have 20 or 30 videos. You share them on um, face. Um, you share them on Dropbox or Google to your family. That'll make a generation change in your family. Why? Because your great, great granddaughter and your great, great grandson, someone that you will never even know can see what you said and your family said about the Bible impacted your life. That will generation change them. And it's not someone you'll never even know. But folks, you can take this to your church and you can tell your pastor, hey, well, let's start a tradition. Everyone in our church videotapes everybody in their family. And we bring all those videos back to the church and the church can store it. So the church can show hundreds of years of people of what the Bible has done to impact their life. I have pastors that stand here and say that will generation change my church. Then uh, I'm actually uh, was trying to design an app. I brought a guy here. I didn't, actually, I didn't bring the guy here. The guy came here on his own. He was praying, God, help me be used. I'm, I'm an app designer. And we met and he said, Ryan, I think I'm supposed to help you. And I said, well, I had a thought that came out of my brain before it came out of my mouth to have an app like Ancestry.com, if you know what Ancestry.com is. So if you can see whoever you're related to, you can see their video testimonies, how the Bible impacted their life. And we can literally tag it by subject. So let's say the person had alcohol problems or pornography problems or anorexia problems or opioid problems or whatever. And literally you can go on to see your family line, all the things there, but you can also tag it. And then you could go into Google and you could say, you know, I'm in Dallas, Texas, and I have alcohol problems, what do I do? And we had, let's say 300,000 people from Dallas, Texas, that have uploaded their video, 50,000 of them were alcoholics, but not aren't anymore because the Bible impacted their life. 20,000 used to be addicted to pornography, but aren't anymore because the Bible impacted their life. 10,000 used to be anorexics that aren't anymore because the Bible impacted their life. 15,000 used to be uh, addicted to opioids, but aren't anymore if the Bible impacts their life. Folks, that would make a generational change, city by city, country by country, but throughout the higher, entire world. And there's a church with 200,000 people in Hyderabad, India. That church could upload 200,000 videos in one day, and literally Hyderabad, India would be changed because they'd see how the Bible has impacted those people's lives. Now, this is like building a railroad across the United States. Over the West Coast, up the Rocky Mountains, very steep, very hard. Remember when they drove a golden spike into the ground in Promontory Point? People came from the east and the west. You are building track across Nebraska and Kansas. It's flat. Go just get 20 videos. Go get 20 videos. Go get 20 videos. So when the app is built, we can upload 100 million videos like in a week, and we can have the world see that the Bible has impact right now in an app like that. So this is the impact floor. It's the longest floor. Everything else is downhill from here, folks because this is the longest floor. It's the impact of the Bible in America, the impact of the Bible in the world, and the impact of the Bible right now. Now we're gonna to go to the story floor real quickly and then to the history floor, and then we'll be on with our tour. So let's just see. Brent, can you still hear me? Everything good? Everything's good. Okay. Okay. And you can still hear me, Brent? All good. Good. So now we're going to go from the impact floor to the story floor and the history floor. So the story floor is saying, what is the Bible? What is the story? The Hebrew Bible walkthrough, which is a 30 minute walkthrough of the entire Old Testament. It's like a Disney animators um, designed this with us to have a, um, a story that you could walk through, literally see something, hear something and do something. You'd be walking through it. Then you have the New Testament theater. That's an 11 minute overview of the New Testament from John's perspective, the youngest apostle and the last apostle. And then you have what's called the world of Jesus of Nazareth. It's a first century replica of Nazareth with historical interpreters talking to you as if they were in Nazareth. So here is the Hebrew Bible walkthrough. Now we're not going to go into that because it's 30 minutes. You came to the museum, you could do that, but that's right there. You walk into that little arch and you go 30 minutes into the Old Testament. Right up here, is the New Testament theater. This is an 11 minute overview of the entire New Testament from John's perspective, the youngest apostle and the last apostle. So you go into those doors right there and 11 minutes later, John, the youngest apostle and the last apostle has explained the death, burial and resurrection to you. He shows what went on. He shows how people were feeling and what actually went on through there. And then we're gonna walk into the world of Jesus of Nazareth here in a second. But right here is the Galilee theater. This is the story of John the baptizer. John the baptizer stands in front of Herod Antipas and he says to Herod Antipas that he shouldn't marry his brother's wife. Obviously not good, but Herod Antipas doesn't like that, but he doesn't do anything to John. Then Salome dances in front of Herod Antipas and her, um, she and Herod, Herod Antipas says, Salome, you can have anything you want. What do you want? She says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter because her mother Herodias told her to say that about John. And John goes to his death and the famous verse is quoted um, from Isaiah 40 and 1 Peter 1, 24, 25. 
the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. And then John goes to his death right there. Uh, the Herod Antipas is played by John Reese davies who's from Lord of the Rings, Gimli, if you know that is. So here's the world of Jesus of Nazareth. This is a first century replica of Nazareth with historical interpreters talking to you about how the Bible, uh, how the Bible was in Nazareth. So there's 14,000 hand-painted stones with forced perspective to make you feel like you're on the hillsides of Nazareth. We took over 500 pictures of the Garden of Gethsemane trees right there so you can see the trees just as they are in the Garden of Gethsemane. And right here then is the parables of Jesus, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son, or the prodigal son, and the different things in there so you can understand the parables. And right in here we show like the sheep and different things like that so you can feel like you're in a first century replica of Nazareth. Now come in here, we'll go into the home. Right in here is the home. Now remember in Deuteronomy, the seven foods of the Bible that um, they talk about are the wheat and the barley and the pomegranate. I mean, wheat and the barley and the grapes and the olives and the pomegranate and the fig and the honey. Seven foods of the Bible in Deuteronomy. We let kids stand here and in historical. Brent, was I muted? Yeah, for about maybe 10 seconds. Okay, so did you see, we were talking about uh, Deuteronomy, um, the seven foods of the Bible, the wheat and the barley and the grapes and the olives and the pomegranate and the hit fig and the honey. Did you, you see that or I just said that? Uh, that's right where we lost you. Good, okay, so now you got that. And this is the uh, a marriage certificate from um, ancient Israel uh, um, back in the day of what they would have looked like. And this is the, um, like a kitchen, if you will. Now we're gonna walk into the mikvah. The mikvah was the Jewish ceremonial cleansing bath. So it's uh, seven steps down to a Jewish ceremonial cleansing bath. Five feet wide by four feet long by four or five feet deep. This is how the Jewish people cleanse themselves ceremonial. So they do ceremonial cleans. Now, now you that are, are Protestants or believe in the New Testament, if you will, you know that Jesus Christ is your mikvah. That's who cleanses you of your sin. You don't go into a ceremonial cleansing bath before you go into the temple. But Jesus Christ is your mikvah. So that's a mikvah right there. Now we're gonna go into the synagogue. As you can see in a historical interpreter right here, I'm um, talking to people about the Torah, but we're gonna go into the synagogue. Now see, we wanna have, this is a, a, a synagogue of the first century. It's about 70 people that would have known each other. It would not have been a mega church. It would have been a small group of people that would have known each other like in Sikar or a small Nazareth or um, in small little cities. But what we would normally do here is we would um, talk, say something like Jesus read from the Torah uh, from the prophet Isaiah, uh, actually from talk from the prophet Isaiah, and, uh, and said, the law is now fulfilled in your hearing. And then he sat down, and the people actually at first were enamored with what he said. And then they got angry and angry, and they said, isn't this Joseph's son? He's blaspheming, and they kicked him out of the temple, and they tried to stone him. There's two ways that you could stone a man. You could throw a man off a cliff to stone him, or you could take stones and throw at him. And the Bible says Jesus passed before their very midst. Now, you that read the Bible and you know the story, you know that I actually had you in Luke 4, and I just went through all Luke 4, and a quick synopsis, because see, you're not watching a play or, or you're not reading about a play, you're in the play. We remove the fourth wall. See, you're actually sitting here in the synagogue as if you were in the story and you could feel the feelings of what it would have felt like for Jesus to be teaching in the synagogue and you would hear that and then people would have got angry at him. So that's why we want to remove the fourth wall so that you're actually in the story. Remember, see some of your eyes, hear some of your ears and do some of your body or hands. Now, we're gonna take a left out of the synagogue and we're gonna have a modern day miracle. Uh, in one second, you're going to be transported to Galilee. If you won't need a dollar or a thousand dollars out of your pocket, you'll actually be in Galilee. So this is from the top of Mount Arbel. There's a tree literally on the top of Mount Arbel like this that's flown out of a helicopter. And you look into the Sea of Galilee right here. Jerusalem would be down to your right here, south, and Syria and Lebanon would be up to your left. This is the Sea of Galilee. This is where about Jesus did about 80% of his ministry in this region. Gergus is where the pigs ran into the water filled with the demonic spirits. You remember that story. Capernaum is where Peter's home was. Magda is where Mary Magdalene was from. Bethsaida, Chorazin and Bethsaida, two interesting towns. Jesus said, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles done inside your towns were done inside of Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. Jesus was rebuking those two towns. Why? Because they saw all of his miracles. The feeding of 5,000 was in Bethsaida. Three of the disciples were from Bethsaida. Chorazin was right near Capernaum. So when Peter walked on water, people in Chorazin probably would have heard Peter like he was bragging, hey, I walked on water and I fished on the other side of my boat and God brought all these fish into my, 
boat, Jesus brought all these fish in my boat, and they would have heard all that, and they rejected Jesus' miracles, and Jesus rebuked him. And still to this day, no one lives in the modern towns of Chorazin or Bethsaida. This is where Peter would have walked on water. This is where he would have fished, and uh, God said to put it, Jesus said to put his nets on the other side of the boat. And this is where all these miracles would have happened, and Jesus would have done his ministry. So we like to say this is a reflectionary. You'd sit down in these so you'd reflect on what Jesus did in this area so that you can think about what actually went on and put yourself in the scene. So give me your phone again, and I'll take a picture of all you guys again so this group can have a picture here so they can post it on social media afterward to show people, um, you know, what was going on. So everybody stand there, and I'll just get real quick. Oops, sorry, sorry. Here we go. Just come over to your left. Come over to your left. Just move to the left. Move to the left. Everybody move to the left. Move to the left. There you go. Perfect. One, two, and three. One, two, and three. Awesome. One, two, and three. There you go. This is my brother that worked here with the Museum of the Bible with me for many years. So he and his wife work at the museum. Yeah. Come on over here. Uh, hey, Ryan. how are you? you can I can I come in there and are talk? You traveling very quickly. We all we always travel you quickly. Yeah. The short cut Thank to the you. Sea of yes, we did. So good to good see you. To see you. It's been many months. Yes, it has. It has many months. Oh, come on. Come on over here. Come on over here. So this is so this is the um, the olive press. So the the press would be the the stone would be rolled over the olives, and the olives would form a mash or a paste, and that mash or paste would be put into mash sacks right here, and those mash sacks. We piled on top of each other without any weight at first. The first press would ooze out. It's called the virgin press. It was used for worship and first fruits because it was worship to God. The second press of those um, uh, mash sacks would be put under a lot of weight. You see these stones right here, back here on the picture? Those stones would be pressed down and they all would be pressed. And that second press was used for food and for medicinal purposes and for cosmetics. And then the third press, a lot more weight was added so that the little black pits in the olive would be crushed. No one would eat bitter olive oil. So they would put it in the lamps right here. Now, a lot of people say that Jesus was crushed on our behalf for the same three reasons, that we would worship him, that he's the bread of life, and he lights our path. Now, Jesus also had a parable. If you make a little child stumble, it'd be better for you to throw a millstone around your neck and jump into the ocean if you make a little child stumble or you let predators go after them. Now, think about that, folks. This is a millstone. I don't have a millstone in my home. You probably don't have a millstone in your home. So you're like, what's a millstone? Maybe it's a little weight. Nope, this is a millstone. You can't swim with that around your neck. Michael Phelps couldn't swim with that around his neck. The point being, Jesus is being very clear. He's being emphatic of how you should protect little children and how you should not make a little child stumble because that is what you should throw around your neck and jump into the ocean if you do. Jesus taught in parables where people could understand what he was saying because he was talking in the modern day here. That's why a good pastor or a good shepherd of people, he talks in a way where little people can understand and they can go, oh, by hearing, I see that. Now we're gonna go into a home. Thank you, Rabbi. Now we're gonna go into a home where, where um, you can see uh, the, the um, mud and thatched roof and then the reeds. Now, some people say like, how did the paralytic get into the home? How did the paralytic get into the home? Well, if you, if you have mud and thatch and reeds, you can just move those away and you can drop the paralytic down and that's where Jesus, come on into the home. That's where Jesus could have healed the paralytic right here. And then we also have the lentil uh, post and the door, door posts. Um, and remember the children of Israel were in Egypt and they needed to get out. So the blood of the Passover lamb. Well, let's say your father had a little lamb and he was running around the home for the last four days around the floor and you're playing with that lamb. And then your father takes that lamb and kills that lamb and takes the blood of that lamb and literally scrapes the blood on the door post and the lentil, the lentil post and the door post. And you would not forget that. That's why the children of Israel asked their fathers, why is this night different than any other night, other night, father? And the father would say, because the blood of the lamb is spread for us so that we will get out of bondage of Egypt. It's the same way that the blood of the lamb is given for you. He made atonement for you. He made a sacrifice for you so that you don't have to do it, but he does it and his blood covers you just like it's on the doorpost for the children of Israel and you can go free. Now also the very important stone is the cornerstone of a building. If you don't have the cornerstone laid right, your building will literally fall down. That's why we show a cornerstone over here. And you know that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. God says that he will build his church on Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. That's why we show a cornerstone right here, as you can see, and is hewn out so that the cornerstone be correct so that the building can come. Now, we've just seen the story floor. We talked about the uh, Old Testament walkthrough, the New Testament theater. We'll probably come back to that at the end of the tour. But we just toured the world of Jesus in Nazareth. It's a first century replica of Nazareth with historical interpreters talking about the home and the mikvah and the synagogue and the olive press 
and the, and, the, and the ancient home and showing the trees just like in the Garden of Gethsemane because we want to put you in the scene. Remember, we want to remove the fourth wall to get you to see some of your eyes, hear some of your ears, and do some of your body. So now we're going to go to the fourth floor, which is the history floor. We've just seen the impact floor. Is the Bible good? The story floor, what is the story of the Bible? And now the history floor saying, hey, prove it to me. Show me that it's true. Come on, and we'll go right to that. Okay, Brent, if you have any questions, we're going to be doing a little bit of walking here, and we can uh, start with that. Yeah, if you have uh, any questions. No questions. We've, we've prompted, but any comments or questions, folks, if you want to just pop them in the chat box, and I can relay them to Ryan on when we have little breaks like this. Folks, um, uh, write in the chat if you want to or whatever, how this is helping you or if this is helping you or what I can do to better because I'm trying to better serve you in every way and talk about things that are relevant to you that you'll understand and at the same time will be an encouragement to you and a blessing to you and, uh, and something that will make you say, hey, I want other people to be on this tour because all it is is me walking around explaining more of the Bible to you from Museum of the Bible. And I'm doing this on my own. I'm not an employee of Museum of the Bible, but I'm doing this because um, I think to engage people with the Bible um, God's transformative word is some of the best things like we are literally in a time right now in history where the world is on fire and it's assaulting the truth right now. And the Bible says in John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And therefore, the Bible is a mooring that does not change. Everything else can change, but the Bible does not. So in a day and age when the Bible, when the truth is being assaulted, the best thing to get people to have a mooring that's a rock, that's a foundation, is to explain the Bible to them so they can understand what's actually going on and they can literally have something to latch onto. So what's going on in the 21st century. So I hope that's helpful. So now we're on the history floor. Now this is the last main floor. We saw the impact of the Bible. We saw the stories of the Bible. Now we're gonna talk about the history of the Bible. Right here is Dave Stotts. Dave Stotts drives you around in this Jeep right here and a couple cool cars. That's Dave Stotts right in there on the wall. Dave Stotts has the history of the Bible. History, drive through history of the Bible, and he drives around that Jeep and a couple cool cars showing you all the places where the Bible was written throughout the world. But we're going to walk into here, the chronological walk through the Bible from 3000 BC to the modern age. And we're going to crescendo with what's called illuminations. So we're walking in here into the Bible's impact, uh, the 3000 year old uh, impact of the Bible from 3000 years, 3000 BC to the modern age. Now, Dave Stotts has four video vignettes of five minutes each but I'm gonna explain those videos to you right there. I'm just gonna to go to the places where he talks about. Right over there, they're not there right now, but right over there was the oldest artifacts in the entire museum, 4,100 year old cuneiform. Cuneiform is wet clay that's pressed with a stylus. It's baked and it's hardened. So it's a historic document that does not change. It's called cuneiform. This is a, a example of cuneiform. It's called the Gilgamesh tablet sequence. We uh, used to have the Gilgamesh tablet dream sequence, much like Joseph and Daniel's dreams. This is like the flood, like the flood stories. This is cuneiform, wet clay pressed with a stylus, baked in its hardened, so it's a historic document that does not change. The Gilgamesh tablet and the, and the flood sequence and the dream sequence were like 3,100 year old cuneiform. But this right here is the Nebuchadnezzar brick. This is a brick from Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom right here cuneiform right here this is an original piece of history this is a 2600 year old brick with the literally cement it's called bitium on the top of that there and in in uh, cuneiform writing talking about nebuchadnezzar's kingdom that's the historical biblical figure nebuchadnezzar from the bible you can take a picture if you want remember folks these are things outside the bible they're talking about and explaining the bible but they're not the bible this is a history lesson that we're going through right here dave stotts is going to uh, talk to you more but we're going to go over here to the merneptostella so come over here and we'll talk about the Merneptah Stella. The Merneptah Stella was written in 1208 BC. Pharaoh Merneptah chronologued his kingdom on a 10 foot high stone slab. You can go to the Cairo Museum in Egypt to this day and you can see this 10 foot high stone slab. On line 27, it says, Israel is laid waste, his seed is no longer. Now folks, think about that. That's a Pharaoh bragging about defeating the nation of Israel before 1208 BC in the land of Canaan. Now, that'd be pretty stupid or foolish for a pharaoh to brag about people that do not exist. That'd be like me saying, hey, look at all the green Martians on our tour today. And after about two minutes, you'd be like, there's no green Martians on your tour. Like, have a good day, Ryan. We'll see you. Pharaoh Meneptah actually chronologed his kingdom and said, I defeated Israel in 1208 BC or before. And that's showing the Bible's impact on the history and the world. Why? Because you say, how do we know that it actually says that? Well, because we have the Rosetta Stone, which is in the British Museum and Library. And the Rosetta Stone has uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, Demotic script, 
and, a, and Greek together so we can transliterate the passage to understand what it says because we can take the Greek and see what the Egyptian hieroglyphic says and know that Israel's laid waste, the seed is no longer, which it's right here. There's line 27 on the Merneptah Stella and it says Israel is laid waste, his seed is no longer. And that was from the Merneptah Stella in 12, around 1208 BC or earlier, exactly what happened. Remember folks, these are things outside the Bible, I'm talking about explain the Bible, but this is not the Bible. There are three places where King David is mentioned outside the Bible. One is a signet ring on the Southern Steps. I've been to the Southern Steps in Israel. I've taken a picture of that signet ring, one foot from it. It says House of David on it. Right over here is the Tel Dan stone. In the city walls of Dan, this is a replica of it. In the city walls of Dan is an actual piece of the wall that says House of David mentioned exactly with the eight kings in chronological order, just as it should be. And one others is in the is the Meshestella, which is in the Louvre in Paris, France. And on this stone, the Meshestella, it says House of David and Israel. That, that, that's from the Moabites. The people that didn't even like the Israelites are talking about the Israelites and the David. These are three things outside the Bible, talking about and explaining the Bible. But folks, this is not the Bible. It's a history lesson. Right over here is the Nebuchadnezzar cylinder. In 580 BC, Nebuchadnezzar had this cuneiform uh, barrel uh, to chronologue his kingdom. Literally on the barrel is the history. They would put some of these barrels in the walls of the, of the, of the uh, city so that if anyone destroyed it, out of the walls would come the history of that city. And that's the Nebuchadnezzar cylinder from 580 BC. Folks, that's a 2,600 year old piece of history from the chronological historical figure, Nebuchadnezzar. This is the Lachish relief. In 701 BC, the Assyrians mark, marched up a siege ramp and killed uh, uh, Israelites in the battle of Lachish. Now, some of you are like, what's Lachish? Read Micah 1. And Michael 1 will explain what Lachish is. And as you can see, Assyrians marching up a siege ramp. They shot arrowheads at the Israelis. The Israelis took sling stones and slung them back. And we have the arrowheads on our sixth floor. We have the arrowheads and the sling stones from that battle from 701 BC, which is 2,721 years ago, folks. You literally can see the artifacts from that battle. These are things outside the Bible. Talking about and explain the Bible, but that's not the Bible either, folks. It's a history lesson. And here's the last time we talk about that, which is the second temple period or the Herodian temple. The Herodian temple is the temple that Jesus walked into in 33 AD, folks. You can go to our sixth floor and you can touch a stone from the second temple period. That's the temple that Jesus walked into in 33 AD. You literally can touch a stone from that temple that Jesus walked into. Folks, these are all things outside the Bible. They're talking about and explain the Bible, folks, but they're not the Bible. It's a history lesson. Now we're going to start talking about the Bible. Remember, we need to do progressive learning. One plus one equals two, a history lesson, to go to two times two equals four, which is the Bible lesson. You are now we're talking about the Tanakh, the Torah, the Ketuvim, and the Nevim, or as you would know it, the Old Testament. Remember, the mission statement in the Bible is to invite all people to engage with the Bible. What is engagement? See some with your eyes, hear some with your ears, do some with your body. So we play a matching game right here. So for people from three years old to 103 years old can literally try to match things together to understand papyrus, parchment, and vellum. Why? If you don't know what papyrus, parchment, and vellum is, you're not going to understand the rest of the 20 uh, minutes of the tour because that's what the Bible was written on, papyrus, parchment, and vellum. Well, um, so that's like progressive learning. One plus one equals two, two times two equals four, eight divided by four equals two, geometry, trigonometry. We got to get you to understand simple concepts so that we can move you along and understand deeper ones so that you know in 1947, a Bedouin threw a rock and hit a kick threw a rock into a cave and hit jars much like these. And out of those jars came thousands of Dead Sea Scroll fragments. Uh, some, some of the fragments uh, are right over there actually, but this is the probably the greatest fragment that's ever found. This is the entire book of Isaiah in one contiguous scroll predating Christ at 125 BC with all the prophecies intact found 20 miles east of Jerusalem in the Qumran caves written by the Essene community. Now, folks, if you understand what I just said right there, that's probably the best archaeological find in the history of the world as it dates to the Bible, and you're looking at it right now, the great Isaiah scroll. Now, the original is in the Book of the Shrine. I've been to the Book of the Shrine to see it. They actually put it under the ground after a while because it started to crack and fray, and they made a paper copy. We have a parchment copy, so it's probably one of the best copies in the world, but it's the entire Book of Isaiah. Now, before this Book of Isaiah, 125 B.C., the oldest copy that they had in the world was 900 AD. That's 1,025 years difference. Now, a lot of people said, oh, the Bible has been mistranslated and miscommunicated and it's not accurate and everything. So everyone said, well, hey, it'll prove it that the Bible's not accurate because we'll put these two scrolls together and they'll be so different. We'll prove that. Well, they put the two scrolls together. Guess what happened, folks? It was identical. The only differences were there were some spelling variations of a word. A word was spelled differently. There were some accent points that were different, like an apostrophe. An accent point is kind of like an apostrophe. If I said C-A-N-T, you know I said can't. I just didn't use the apostrophe, but you know I said can't. 
The only other uh, uh, differences were some scribal errors. One scribe had put John ran to the tree. Another uh, scribe had put the tree ran to John. Clearly we know trees don't run. So that was a scribe that just made a mental error. Folks, that showed over 1,025 years, the Bible had been written with like 96% accuracy, handwritten over 1,025 years. If you're a statistic, statistician at all, you understand what that means. Your mouth just dropped. You're like, how in the world? It's because of God wanted to preserve his word, folks. That's why. Now you understand. Here we're going to go from 199 AD to 399 AD. This is the Codex Comacchia Scriptus. So Scriptus is something that you rewrite on. We own 137 pages of this. As you can see, there's writing on the top. But if you look in really closely, there's writing under it. So we had to use multispectral imaging to break out the layers. And what you see here is a copy of some of the oldest parts of Deuteronomy and Leviticus in the world, because what was under that was this that we had in multispectral imaging. And that's some of the oldest parts of Leviticus and Deuteronomy in the entire world. Now, this is the oldest part of John 8 in the entire world. If you ever read John 8, this is the oldest piece of John 8 in the entire world. It's called P39. You can study these online. There's P52, there's P39. They're all numbered and named P for a papyrus and parchment. Um, and that is P39. Now, right over here is the Wyman fragment. This is one of the top things that I like in the entire museum. People say, what is the thing that you like the most? It's probably this. This is Romans 5, 1 through 13. It's on the front and the back. We're just showing Romans 8 through 13, 5, 8 through 13 right now. But this is the Wyman fragment. On, on this, you can see that little brown fold right there. In the brown fold, they discovered an Omicron, not an Omega. The Omicron would have forced the reading of Romans 5, 1 to say, we have peace with God. Now imagine how your life would change if you knew you had peace with God, as opposed to you have to do something to earn peace with God. And there's the proof right there from 200 to 250 AD. Now folks, Homer's Iliad has 1,500 extant copies of Homer's Iliad. And um, the oldest copy, uh, meaning closest to his death, so about 600 years after his death. The Bible has four times more manuscript evidence for the Bible, 6, 000, over 6,000 extant copies. And the oldest copies you're looking at right here are about 125 years after the original author would append it. And folks, literally, people, nobody argues about it. I mean, I believe Homer wrote the Iliad. Everybody believes Homer, Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. And here we have the Bible with four times more manuscript evidence and way closer to when the people did. And that's where you have right there showing. And you can go literally to the Chester Beatty Library right here, Greek letter by Greek letter to the book of Romans. And you can see Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10.13, Greek letter by Greek letter, folks. You could read the book of Romans right there and you can see God's word preserved from 200 AD right there. Now, here's probably one of the most important things in the entire book as a, as a, as a big picture, as a philosophy. Some of you pragmatics are gonna like this because it's a big picture of the whole thing. This is called Book of Books. Now, a lot of people say the Bible is this discongruent book that does not agree with itself and contradicts itself. And I'm like, hey, don't you think you should look at data before you make a claim like that? And people are like, yeah, yeah, I'm a person of data. I live in the 21st century. Let's look at data first. I say, okay, great. Let's look at data. Here's the data. Um, the Bible was written over 4,000 years by dozens of authors that did not know each other. Obviously, Job did not Peter did not know Peter, and, and Paul did not know uh, Moses. And the Bible was written in at least by, by, by probably 40 people, at least three languages in at least three countries, probably more like four or five countries when you look at where Paul went on a modern day map. And what we did is we chronologued every Bible with color codes to show you how alike that they are. Now folks, here's how I'll go into this. The blue is the Torah or the first five books of the Bible. It's in every single Bible, all 14. The green is the rest of the entire Old Testament or Tanakh as you would, Tanakh or Old Testament as you would know it. That's in every single Bible except for one, the only Bible that does not have the complete Old Testament is only read by 2,500 people in the entire world. It's called the Samaritan Bible. The pink is the entire New Testament. So now we have all 66 books are in every Bible except for one Bible plus an additional 2,500 people. And I just exhausted all the colors because the only color left is red. Red means a book was added to one of the Bibles, but nothing was subtracted. So the 66 books are in all 14 except for one book plus 2,500 people. Folks, if I told 40 people, write a book, write a book, write a book, write a book, you don't live in the same millennia. You don't even know each other. Write a book, write a book, write a book. You are not. You don't speak the same language. Write a book, write a book, write a book, write a book. You don't uh, live in the same country. How congruent would your books be? And you're like, not very. And I'm like, that's an understatement because it's like the telephone game. If we just tell, tell the 10 or 15 people that are standing here, you know, whisper something to someone else. By the time it got to the 10th person, it wouldn't even be the same thing. It would be so jumbled. But here you literally see, whoops, got to decline that. 
Brett, can you hear me still? Brett, can you hear me? Brett, can you hear me? I'm just trying to make sure. Yep, I can hear you and your audio is back Good. on. Okay, so so um, if I told 40 people, write a book, write a book, you don't live in the same country or whatever, how congruent would your books be? They wouldn't be congruent at all because the telephone game proves that in five minutes of people that are literally standing in front of each other in the same language and they're literally saying it one minute after each other. And here's how congruent the Bible is over 4,000 years, why? Well, you could stay here for an hour and you could read all the details why, or you could take a seminary class for a year. But the point is, is look, look at how much God's word has been preserved over 14 different Bibles, over 4,000 years, over 40 different authors in three different languages in five different countries. Why? Because God's word has power and that power has translation power into understanding what you are going to do next with it, which is what I'm going to come to next. Now, here is um, from few to many. This gets into how the Bible um, has translated. By 200 AD, there were only three languages in the world that had a Bible. Why? Because it would take a scribe two to three years to do one handwritten copy. We're about 20 minutes away from the end of the tour here, folks, just so you can understand. 200 AD, there's only three languages in the world have a Bible. Why? Because it would take a scribe two to three years to do one handwritten copy. 400 years later, there's only 10 more languages in the world that have a Bible. Why? Because it would take a scribe two to three years to do one handwritten copy. The rest of the floor is uh, hit an inflection point in 1454. That's the Gutenberg Press. We'll show you that. The rest of the floor is dedicated to Bible translation. It actually took a hockey stick growth up. That's called profusion, folks. Profusion is just astronomical growth. More put on the internet day than you can read in a lifetime. There's more put on the internet in one day than your grandparents saw in their entire life. That's called profusion. We're going to show you how Bible translations hit that and how you can be involved in it today. Right over here is the hours and Psalter of Elizabeth the Boone. Now, this is a handwritten, hand-painted, gold-leaf Bible. One page is more than a family would make in their entire life back in the 1330s. So an entire book of this is only for the super mega wealthy. The Elizabeth the Boone family was super mega wealthy. They commissioned this Bible in 1330 AD. And uh, 700 years later, basically, almost 700 years later, the book got lost. They had passed it down as a generational tradition in their family, but it got lost. The uh, chairman of our board, founder, and bought this Bible in an auction and donated to the museum. With research, we were able to determine that this Bible, Jack, uh, uh, his wife, Jackie Green, is the Elizabeth the Boone's 21st great-granddaughter. Folks, this was an heirloom from their family they didn't even know that was lost, that they had to, through God's providence, buy at an auction. And they were able to see what this meant to them, that their family had preserved a tradition of how the Bible impacts their life. Now, folks, we did it more simply for you. You have the Joshua machine. You can go into that machine, or you can take your iPhone, remember I told you, and you could videotape each of your family members, how does the Bible impact your life? How does the Bible impact your life? How does the Bible impact your life? And then you use Google Drive or Dropbox to get that out of your family. If you don't know what I just said right there, just use email. And you, for hundreds of hundreds of years, your family can see how the Bible has impacted your life. And that will make a generation change in your family. You should do that with your church. Your church should have every person that's a member of your church videotape of how the Bible impacted your life. And that can be kept and stored for hundreds of years and have impact. And then we can do, use the app so it can go subject by subject, city by city throughout the entire world. And that's that. That's the Josh machine. Now, right over here. Can you still hear me, Brent, and see me? Yes, I can. Right over here is the very first person. This is the history of the entire Museum of the Bible. This is the very first purchase ever in Museum of the Bible. If you want to know the history of the museum, it's right here. This is the Rossbury Roll. In November 2009, this is the very first purchase of Museum of the Bible ever. Bought this in November in 2009. In 2010, we incorporated as the 501c3. 2011. We purchased, uh, we um, started to do traveling exhibits. We went to six cities in the United States. We went to five different countries. We went to the Vatican twice, we went to Cuba twice, we went to Argentina once, we went to Germany three times and Jerusalem, Israel once. In 2012, we bought the building that you're standing in. In 2013, we did architectural plans. And in 2014, destroyed every other floor. Why? Remember, this is a refrigerated warehouse. We had to blow 10 foot meat lockers into 20 foot beauty that you see before you. In 2015, 16, and 17 was construction, and eight short years later, that's half the time in the average museum take of 16 years was done in eight years the museum opened. And the founder of the museum says, no one's smart enough to do that. That's a miracle, praise God, and I say the same thing. In 680, there's only 13 languages in the world that have a Bible. Why? Take a scribe two to three years to do one handwritten copy. 850 years later, only 20 more, 27 more languages in the world have a Bible. Why? Take a scribe two to three years to do one handwritten copy. So the entire world changed over here with the Gutenberg Press. Dave Stotts in his third video vignette of four talks about the Gutenberg Press, Martin Luther, Rasmus, the Reformation. The Gutenberg Press, though, needed content. Why? Because if you don't have content, you can't translate, you don't have the languages to be able to 
the, to uh, print Bibles. So if you don't have the Bible in German, Latin, or English, you can't put it in German, Latin, or English with the Gutenberg Press. So what is the key to the content? Is the content translators. Who are they? Erasmus, Luther, and Tyndall. Right over here, Erasmus will tell you from his own preface why he translated the Bible. He's going to tell you that he translated the Bible. He's writing from his own preface right there. He's going to tell you why he translated the Bible. He says, I translated the Bible because I wanted the average everyday man to be able to read the Bible in his own language. Because he knew the Bible was sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and incense of the heart. But if you can't read the Bible in your own language, you don't even know what I just said. So he literally talks here in 4K resolution about why he translated the Bible. Now, folks, think about this. What is the key to the Internet? What is the key to the Internet? The key to the Internet is content. Who are the content translators of the Internet? The content translators of the Internet are you and you and you and you because you're going to get pictures of the Museum of the Bible. And you could go out on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube and you could post those pictures and say the Museum of the Bible is great. I love the Bible. The Bible has made so much impact in my life. And you will post that. And one day, a thousand of your friends will see that. I mean, someone in Japan will see it. Australia will see it. Australia, England will see it. Someone in 26 states, the United States will see it. Let's say someone in Philadelphia sees it. I'm just making up a story. They have two boys. The boys are five and eight. Those boys see your post posted from another friend. They tell their parents they want to go to the Museum of the Bible to ride the ride that you talked about. They come to the Museum of the Bible. They're impacted by the Bible. They, they, they see something with their eyes. They hear something in their ears. They do something with their body, and their life changes. They become missionaries to some faraway land that you've never been. You see, you took a rock of your life and threw it into a pond, and concentric circles went out that echoed for eternity, and thousands of people were touched by that. Folks, in an entire month, an entire year, people, a thousand people didn't even read uh, Rasmus's preface for his Bible, but literally in one day, you hold the most powerful device in the history of the world. It's a phone connected to the internet, and all you got to do is be a faithful messenger. The Bible says just be a faithful messenger. You don't need, need to worry about the increase. The Bible will give the increase. The Bible says it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides to the soul and spirit and joints and marrow and incense of the heart, and the Bible says you just need to be a faithful messenger. The Bible says it will not return void, and you can bank on that because the Bible is true, and it says that. Folks, you literally can be a rock thrown into a pond and concentric circles go out. You don't even know what will happen from that if you're just a faithful messenger. Now, right over here is Tyndall's Fragment New Testament. This is the first time the Bible was printed in English. And this is Tyndall's Fragment New Testament. Tyndall was burned at the stake in uh, 14, uh, 14, uh, 1536 for putting the Bible in the language that we're speaking in right now. You couldn't even read the Bible if it wasn't for Tyndall printing the Bible in your language right here in English. And right over here is a replica of the Jerusalem Chamber of Westminster Abbey. And these are some of the rarest books in the entire world. These are first edition King James version of the Bibles. And there's some other Bibles here that are some of the oldest in the world. Um, uh, so like we might have one of them and the British library has the other and that's it. Like that's all in the world. The reason I stop here and talk about this is I wanna show you the grand probably succession of texts. Now folks, this is very important. There's four scribal lines of the Bible, okay? There's Codex Vaticanus owned by the Vatican for hundreds of hundreds of years, commissioned by Constantine in 300 AD. There's Codex Sinaiticus found at the base of Mount Sinai, very old Bible also, like 1600 years. Codex uh, Alexandrinus, found in the Alexandria Library, and then Codex of Fremi Rescriptus. It's a rescriptus, you know what that is, it's rewritten on, scraped away and rewritten on. Ephraim had some sermons, they scraped over them, put the Bible there, those are the four scribal lines. When you read the King James Version of the Bible, reading Codex Vaticanus, why? Because the Codex Vaticanus ended up being the Coverdale Bible right here, right there, which ended up being the Matthew Bible right there, which ended up being the Great Bible right there, which ended up being the Geneva Bible right there, which ended up being the Bishop's Bible right there. Folks, they took uh, uh, about 40 Bishop's Bibles and they took them to Oxford and Cambridge. And they said to the scholars at Oxford and Cambridge, hey, what would you change about the Bishop's Bible to make it better? 17% of the Bishop's Bible they changed, 87% they kept the same, and they made the King James Version out of the 17% changes. So 87% or 13%, uh, 83% uh, same, 17% changes. So out of the Bishop's Bible, King, the King James for the Bible, the 17% changes that the Oxford and scholars uh, in the rooms in Cambridge and Oxford said. Now, the reason why I say that is because you read the Bible, you're reading, uh, you're not reading a book like Harry Potter that's 20 years old or George, George Orwell 1984 that's 50 years old or Harriet Beecher Stowe and Cabin that's uh, 100, um, <clears throat> 170 years old. You're reading the Bible with almost 2,000 years of manuscript evidence. Uh, that in, uh, when, you, when you read the NIV, NASV, ESV, NLT, that's Codex Sinaiticus, like 60, over 1,600 years of uh, manuscript evidence. So you can see I'm reading a book that has 1,600 to 2,000 years of manuscript evidence, and I say correct. Right over here, we've got five minutes, and we're done, basically. Right over here, remember, we don't we have the Gutenberg Press, so we went from 35 languages in 1450 with the Gutenberg Press to 350 years, double the languages. Why? We don't need scribes to scribe anymore. We have printers that print, and scribes now can be translators. 
So scribes can move into going to different languages and the printers can print Bibles faster. Now the plan is 3,500 languages in about 20 more years. Why? We don't even need scribes to scribe or many of our printers to print anymore. We have coders that can code and then verbal Bibles are spoken even faster. Here's a copy of the Rosetta Stone in the British Museum and Library. This is Egyptian hieroglyphics, a demotic script and Greek together so that you can know, remember, Pharaoh said in 1208 BC, Israel is laid waste, the seed is no longer. And that's how they knew what it said because the Rosetta Stone uh, was able to have Greek and uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics together. Now these are two, over 2000 Torah scrolls. We own one of the, we own the largest private collection of the Torah scrolls in the entire world. And Rabbi Eliezer Adam right here was a Jewish Torah scroll scribe that was in the Museum of the Bible for a couple of years and scribed the complete Bible, a complete, complete Torah by hand. And here's him doing some of his work. We wanna pay honor and respect to this because the, what the Jewish Torah scroll scribes did, you wouldn't even have your Bible today if you didn't have the Jewish Torah scroll scribes uh, scribing with 99.9% .9 accuracy over thousands of years. And this is the last thing on the tour of Museum of the Bible. Um, this is the, um, Hey, Ryan, you're muted. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, there you go. This is, this is Illuminations. This is every single language of the world represented by a different book. Okay, so you can see different colors. This is a 360 degree room. Every single language in the world is represented by a book, okay? All the books over here that are clear with blue is a complete language with zero verses of the Bible in that language. So that's like, let's say that's the Makulu language. That's 100,000 speakers. Or the Muda language, that's a... Uh, 500,000, 50,000 speakers, let's say, or the mayor language, that's a million speakers, let's say. So this is every language in the world uh, in the world right now that has zero verse to the Bible in that language. Now folks, you literally see it's about half the room, about 3,000 so languages have zero verse to the Bible in that language or in process still have nothing. Only 700 languages of the world have a complete Bible. You don't know how blessed you are, but if you read English, you have over 100 translations of English alone of the English Bible. And these people don't even have one verse in their own language. Only 1500 languages of the world have a New Testament right there. And the rest of the world, almost half of the languages of the world don't even have one verse or finish the entire Bible in their own language. Now folks, the plan is the illuminations to eradicate Bible poverty so that by 2033, every single language in the world can have a Bible and you can go to illuminations.bible yourself and you can sponsor a verse for $35 or you can sponsor a chapter, your family or business can sponsor a chapter for $1,000, or your synagogue, church, temple, or business can sponsor an entire Bible for $500,000 to 1 million. The Illuminations raised $34 million in one day, three years ago when this room was dedicated to knock out an entire row of those Bibles in one day. Um, literally, I've, uh, uh, um, there's things that show people getting their Bibles. And the one that I like the best is a plane that comes and lands on a remote runway. And you can see a, a air packages given to the pastor. And the pastor starts weeping. He stands up and he prays, I'm Simeon. I can die now. I'm complete because he's been translating the Bible for 30 years in his, into his, um, 30 years into his um, uh, language. And he says, I can die now because we have the Bible in our own language. Folks, you cannot be the same once you see that. And literally, I have people that take a picture of this wall and say, we're going to sponsor a language right now. And a, and a church will say, and we're going to give a million dollars to sponsor a language because what are we doing if we're not helping these people get the Bible in their own language? And I say the same thing. So this is uh, literally what's going on. Folks, think about this. It cost $1.3 billion to finish this entire project, $1.3 billion. When I worked at Microsoft, in about three days, we made $1.3 billion. Uh, Avengers Endgame, the movie that came out about two years ago, made $1.3 billion in three days. Folks, this is chump change to the world, and we can get started on it so that by 2033, every single person in the world can have a Bible. Now, you know what? Some of the people believe the Bible says there that uh, God can come back after everyone is heard in their own native tongue. I'm not saying that's exactly, some people think of that different in, um, um, interpretation, but that's a possibility. So we are want to get started and going on having every single language in the world of the Bible. Now, for you that are still on the tour, we're gonna go up to touch a temple, uh, second temple period stone and see the top. And then if you'd like to, we're gonna see the 11 overview of the New Testament. You guys can stay or do whatever you want, but come on. You want me to take a picture of you guys here? Okay, cool. So absolutely. You guys can continue on if you want to. We're going to see a stone of the second temple period if you want to. That's the temple that Jesus walked into. And then you'll see the sixth floor, which is the view of the capital. You can do either one you want. So I'm going to walk up this way. Brent, you can still hear me? 
Yeah, um, getting some comments while you're walking. Great tour, very important from Canada's Arctic. Um, uh, someone said, how long would it take to look thoroughly, like to go through the museum? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. So there's nine, eight hour days for the content, 72 hours for the content, if you read everything and kind of tried to do everything. So there's 72 hours. Um, the I'm just doing, uh, you know, like a two hour tour, like 1.2% of the entire museum. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Hey, um, what's his name? Send me your phone number. Can I give you mine right now? Brent, can um, you mute me just for a second? I'm doing that. Um, there's another. Can you mute me for a second? Uh, I can. Yeah. There you go. While Ryan's muted. Um, we are recording this. I provided to Ryan via Dropbox, and I think that he would um, potentially make the recorded tour available later. We recorded yesterday, but that's um, something for him. And then um, I see a couple other questions, and we'll get back. Uh, Ryan, are you back on? Yep, I'm back. Okay. So this uh, is the Piata. Yeah, go ahead. This is a replica of the Piata of Jesus um, on Mary's lap, if you've ever seen that one. That's a plaster copy of it. Um, so what are you have any questions or anything that people are asking? Yeah, a couple more. The tour is amazing. I learned something every time. Ryan truly inspired me to search the scriptures. How often can you do these Zoom calls? And um, is the recorded tour available later? Yeah, um, I probably will let it be available later. Yes, I'm trying to get, you know, continually better so I don't make any mistakes because I talk about 20,000 words on a tour. So I'm trying to make it perfect or as much perfect as can. Um, I, I will look. The more that we share this with more people, the more I'll come back. You know, we basically, it looks like we've doubled every day that I've done this tour on Zoom. We went from, you know, what we started with, then we, the next day, literally Friday, I did it for the first time on Zoom. Saturday, it was basically double the amount on Saturday that came on Friday. Now, Sunday, it's about double the amount that came on Saturday. So we've literally basically quadrupled what we started with, it looks like, and the amount of people that are watching this. So the more that you share with their friends, the more I'll be able to come back because I just want to get this out to as many people as possible so that the Bible being sharper than a two-edged sword, it will not return void. You know, so what I'm planning on doing is um, going to a retreat center to help them out for two weeks in the West. And it looks like two, so like not, not this coming weekend, but the next weekend, let's say like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I would be touring, or at least Saturday and Sunday, I would be touring Museum of the Bible next two Saturdays from now and two Sundays from now, meaning two weeks from now. So if you could tell your friends so we could have literally hundreds and thousands of people on these, that would be awesome because I can see a vision where literally we're sharing this and people all around the world in hundreds of different countries. I talked to a guy the other day, an Ethiopian pastor that had created and started like hundreds of churches and they had hundreds of thousands of people that came to those churches. And I said, hey, do you guys have cell phones? Yeah, of course. Do we have, do you have Zoom? Do you get on Zoom? Yeah, you have internet? Yes. I said, would you like me to tour you around the Museum of the Bible when you're sitting in Ethiopia? He said, absolutely. I just haven't got to him because I wanted to work out the kinks of this, but he said, yeah, I want you to tour my people. You know, I have people, the pastors calling me and talking to me saying, you know, I want you to do Bible lesson for our Sunday school class for three or four weeks in a row. So let's just open it up folks. I mean, share it with your friends, tell them what you engaged here and how this has helped you. And if it's helped you bring other people on, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's great. And then the last question that we're caught up is, can you let us know how to do the video about the Bible, how the Bible impacted our lives? Um, you mean like our, ta our tape of it? Yeah, I think it was um, a little while back when you were, this question was sparky, but when it, as it related to um, recording the video, recording mm -hmm. our own videos. And, and oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you take your iPhone and you stand in front of your, daughter your wife or your grandmother or whatever and say hey i'm going to go for two minutes tell me how the bible impacts your life and you record them and you take those recordings and you put them into dropbox or google drive and you send that to your family so they can all share them now your whole family can see everybody in the family of how the bible impacted your life so your great great granddaughter someone you will never even know or your great great grandson someone you will never even know can see hundreds of videos about how the bible had impacted your whole family and that will make a generational change on your family and tell your pastor hey pastor Let's tape all the people uh, by video that are members of this church. And when someone joins the church or whatever, they can have access to those so they can see, oh my goodness, here's three people that used to be alcoholics in our church that aren't anymore because the Bible impacted their life. I need to go to them because I need help with that. Or they're uh, pornographers or they're anorexics or they're 
um, you know, addicted to opioids. And now I know three people that used to be addicted to opioids that they're not anymore because the Bible infected life in this church and I can go get help from them. So it's a way and, and I want to make it an app because then you could go onto Google and YouTube videos are the most um, searched thing in all of you, uh, Google and they come up very well on Google. So we could have uh, YouTube videos tagged by like Dallas, Texas slash alcohol slash, you know, God. And then you type in, I have alcohol problems in Dallas, Texas, you know, on a Google search and up would come videos and someone could see videos about how 32,000 people in Dallas, Texas used to have alcohol problems, but don't anymore because the Bible impacted their life. And I think that would make a change too. So at first you just go onto YouTube. I mean, you just take your iPhone and you video or your Samsung and you videotape them and put them into Google Drive or Dropbox or, you know, a storage service. But eventually I want to have an app. The more of these tours go, I can share this with more people and there'll be demand for the app. And then I can get the app developer that said he wanted to help me do it and just um, make it for free because he wanted it done where we would start on something like that. So does that answer your question about that, I think? Yeah, I think that's that's a great response. Um, okay. The, one last question is, the Museum of the Bible addressed the Egyptian chronology problem that resolves the issue of- Hold on just practice. a second. Thank you. Enjoy it. Thank you, brother. Yeah. I hope you did enjoy yeah. it. I got the link out there. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Thanks, brother. In a good way? Yeah. Praise God. Okay, guys. Love you. Okay, yeah, say that question again. Sorry. Okay, sure. Does the Museum of Bible address the Egyptian chronology problem that resolves the issue of correcting when the Old Testament's places and events occurred, new chronology slash revised chronology? Um, what's the first couple question uh, uh, statement, uh, first couple words of that? I, Does I got the that MOB last. address the Egyptian chronology problem? Uh, so the Museum of the Bible was designed to, uh, the mission statement of the Museum of the Bible is to invite all people to engage with the Bible in the most transformative book in the world. So does it answer all the questions? No, it can't because, you know, just like at the end of John, he says, if what was written about all the Bible and, and what Jesus did couldn't be contained in all the books of the world. So all the museums of the world couldn't contain all the uh, explanations. So we had to take a tight approach to three themes, God said, every light, woven upon with branches, branches, leaves, and trees, and everything in the world declares the glory of God. Then you had to uh, take a concept of three main floors, impact, story, and history, and hit the main three of those themes to even be able to address everything in the museum so it would be 100 days long. So we don't specifically, from what I know, address that specific issue, but you can take other things that we talk about and link them together um, like, you know, the Merneptah Stella from Pharaoh Merneptah, and then you could take this story from Egypt and the different things and you can get close to it. But it probably like biology class, remember, I'll take you back to eighth grade or ninth grade biology class, kingdom phylum class, order, family, genius, species. Basically it's hitting kingdom phylum class, it's hitting the top. And then it's going a little bit in to, to, to the detail, just hitting and missing some things because the detail gets so thin that there could be thousands of things and we could only hit like 50 or hundred, let's say. So I don't know that it specifically dresses that exact thing. I'll look up that later um, when I can go back to this video and, and listen to that more, but I, I'm not thinking of a specific spot that answers that exact um, question right now. I hope I, I'm explaining the philosophy and, and the thought behind it because I, I don't know that that question is exactly answered. So. Thanks Ryan. Is that good? Okay, so this is the Israel Antiquity Authority. The Israel Antiquity Authority, tell me if you can hear and see. You can hear and see Brent. Yep. The Israel Antiquity. Yes. Brent, can you hear me? Yeah. The Israel Antiquity Authority gave about 800 artifacts. They're the governing body of all the artifacts in Israel. And they brought over a bunch of different things. We're going to look at just a couple few of them. This is the second temple period stone. That's the temple that Jesus walked into in 33 AD. And literally, you can touch this stone from the second temple period. This is the Temple Mount. And where the, uh, the southern steps right here is where this stone came from uh, on the Temple Mount. Um, the temple that Jesus walked into in 33 AD. And this is a stone from that temple um, right here. And literally I have, you know, um, older ladies I've seen before that I've toured them. They literally come up and touch the stone and they start crying because they for 50 years of their life. And now they know they're touching a stone from the second temple period, the temple that Jesus walked into. And they know here is an artifact that just means so much to them because in the city of Jerusalem right there, here's something specifically, um, you know, that's from that. Remember, folks, these are things outside the Bible, talking about and explaining the Bible. This is not the Bible. It's a history lesson. You know, we talked about some of the Bible. We, we showed you pieces of the Bible, fragments and all these things. 
we showed you how it came together, but some of these things are just history lessons. So here is the arrowheads and the sling stones from the Battle of Lachish. Remember I talked to you about Lachish? There are Lachish iron arrowheads and sling stones. Here are the arrowheads and here are the sling stones. The sling stones are about a one pound rock. This is kind of what David would have killed Goliath with about a sling stone. Some of you are like, how did David kill Goliath with this pebble? Well, it wasn't a pebble. You hit a guy with that with about 50, 60 miles an hour per hour. That's going to you know, do some damage, of course. And then there's some other things from um, Israel. These are the shekel weights, if you will, from Jeremiah 32. And it's like the you know, um, Lady Liberty, or I'm sorry, the Supreme Court, the, the blind lady that uh, with a... With a um, cloth over her face so she can't see so she has to weigh uh, with and without uh, without uh, partiality and then here's um, some water pitchers and these are from about um, 1200 bc so about 3020 years ago so over 3000 years ago these aren't the exact these this is not the picture that jesus put water to wine with but it'd be a picture like this just so you can get context of a picture from about 3000 years ago and um, then this is some jewelry from that time period. Also, this is about um, somewhere around three to 4,000 year old jewelry right here from about 13, 1400 BC. Um, little ringlets and earrings and um, some bracelets and all sorts of stuff. And then there, here's some gods that the uh, people would have worshiped, um, pagan gods that they would have put on their desk or in their mantles at home and things like this. You can see just literally the idol idolatry of the day and just the regular living of the day and things that went on. In the day. Now I'm going to walk you up the stairs um, to the last floor. And we're going to come tour um, so you can see um, the view from the Capitol. And um, I'm also going to talk about uh, there's a public reading of scripture that happens in our uh, New Testament or in our World Stage Theater. I won't go into it because it's done for the day now, but that's a 472 seat theater. We had Amazing Grace, the story of John Newton, the slave trader that gave his life to Christ, gives life to God. And um, that's that played for like two different seasons. And um, Amazing Grace, it was an incredible um, musical. And then this is from the sixth floor. You're gonna be able to see the viz, the woven pomegranate and branches, leaves and trees again, second theme. And here's the view from the top, looking at the Capitol. Um, there's the Capitol right there. So we're about three blocks in the Capitol, about two blocks in the Air and Space Museum, about two blocks in the National Mall, two or three blocks in the National Mall. And here's the um, view of the Capitol. And then we have a 600 seat ballroom here also. So there's the view of the Capitol. This is this little selfie thing on the ground right here. It says, take a picture here so you can see the Capitol behind you. People take selfies all over here. It's just a beautiful view. And then this is the 600 seat ballroom here with, as uh, you can see, 40 foot screen right here, about 50, 40 different TV monitors linked together and about a 600 seat ballroom right here. We've had events in here um, from dignitaries heads of other states to vice presidents of the United States, uh, different things like that. So, and um, I'll walk the last couple of things here on the sixth floor. And then if we have time, wall. can you hear me? That's the million yeah. names wall. Yeah. This is micro calligraphy, remember I said, Woven pomegranate branches, leaves, and trees. These are names. These are all names here. So you can see these names. And that's a pomegranate, and it's a woven pomegranate branches, leaves, and trees. And it's a theme of every person that gave a dollar or more to the museum right there. And then we'll walk you out to the biblical garden. Hey, Ryan, real quick while you're doing that. Um, so if you check, folks, if you check the chat box and you want to uh, put your contact information, preferably an email and a cell phone number, if you're interested, and you can send it to me directly where it says to everyone in the, in the chat box, you can just go to Brent Newman uh, if you don't want everyone on here to see your contact information. Or I put also my, my email. Either way, we'll assemble a list of those of you who are interested in future tours so that we can send out uh, the, the contact information so you could share with your friends and family. That was just me walking around. Thank you, Brent. That was just me walking around the biblical garden. Wanted you all to see it there. It's on the outside on the top floor. And you know, and you got a bunch of beautiful views there. And then we'll go down to the um, back down to the story floor and see if we can get into the New Testament theater. If we can't get in the New Testament theater, um, I'll just end the tour down on the first floor, but we'll just walk down and um, 
and there's the top floor the elevators on the sixth floor so any other things folks remember we saw the impact of the bible or we saw the three themes of museum of the bible god said let there be light genesis 1 3 on the outside the gutenberg press in genesis 1 3. second theme woven pomegranate branches leaves and trees john 15 5 i'm the vine you're the branches you're engrafted in the vine the third theme everything in the world declares the glory of god psalm 19 1 in 17 different languages so everyone in the world can come here with the major languages of the world and read everything in the world that closes the glory of god hopefully this tour has shown you the glory of god and you've been able to see that the glory of god is evident all around you those are three themes that he's in the bible then there's three main floors the impact floor saying is the bible good the story floor saying what is the bible the history floor saying hey prove it to me show me the artifacts show me the, show me the facts each floor has three themes so the impact floor is the impact of the bible in america the impact of the bible in the world and the impact of the bible now the story floor, the Old Testament walk through the New Testament theater and the world of Jesus of Nazareth. And then the history floor saying, Day Stotts drives around in a Jeep and a couple of cool cars. The chronological walk through the Bible from 3000 BC to the modern age. And then we crescendo with what's called illuminations or Bible translation where you can be involved today for $35. You can go to illuminations.bible and you can sponsor a verse for $35 or an entire chapter, your business for $1,000, translate the Bible or your synagogue, church, temple or business. It sponsor an entire Bible for $500,000 to a million. I'm gonna to try to see if the New Testament theater is open to get into there. I think we can be the last ones today. And it's an 11 minute overview of the entire New Testament from John's perspective, the youngest apostle and the last apostle. If you want to stay on folks and watch the New Testament theater, you can, we'll end um, with that. Are we gonna start this Kim in a second? Yeah, okay, so we're almost gonna start this. This is the New Testament theater. And as you can see, Brent, can you hear me still? Yeah, I sure can. And Jesus, the son of man. And then it goes down this poster, the drop of blood. And then who do people say that I am? And then he talks about Jesus here saying, Jesus is called many things. Is he a teacher, a blasphemer, a healer, or a magician, a king, or a rebel, the son of God, or ordinary man? Who do people say that I am? Mark 8, 27. Well, we're going to see the New Testament theater right here. Can you hear this? Yeah. This 12 minutes cinematic odyssey paints an authentic portrait of these texts and the stories they tell. And now it's time to begin your journey into the New Testament. Can you hear me, Brent? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we right there. Right. For the comfort and enjoyment of those around you, please turn off or silence all devices. Thank you. Here we go. Brent, can you hear it? Uh, yeah. Yep. Was life, and that life was the light of. 
follow the human kind. Of the twelve who followed Jesus, I was the youngest. I remember the wine. Jesus blessed it and said, This is my blood of the covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I remember the bread. It was his body broken for us. There is no greater love, he said, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. His words confused us at the time. Later that night, they would all become clear. The others slept. Jesus prayed. He said, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And not what I want, but what you The next day, I was there at Golgotha. At the moment of his death, after all we had done to him, he asked God to forgive us. I'm <laughs> 
This Saul of Tarsus, how much evil he had done to the followers in Jerusalem. I expected to find a monster. Instead, I found a broken and humbled man. This man who arrested and bound all who invoked the Lord's name, his destiny was to become an instrument for taking the good news to the people beyond Israel. told us, you must love God with all your heart, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other law greater than this. We set out upon the roads and seas to share the good news. And Saul the Pharisee became known as Paul the Apostle. We established a church where rich and poor, male and female, Jew and Gentile, were all one in Christ. The message traveled from life to life until it could no longer be contained. Many followers paid a dear price. I could not travel. I wrote. Now the time of my departure has come. Keep on doing the things that you have learned. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. As for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. But faith, hope, and love remain. These three. And the greatest of these is love. I was the youngest of the twelve. Now I am the last. And I wondered if this journey would end with me. But my old teacher came one last time with a message. The home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. There will be no more night. For the Lord God will be their light.
that was uh can you hear me brent yeah that was the Lebanon overview of the new testament from john's perspective the youngest apostle and the last apostle as you saw and finishing up on patmos with him so i'm going to walk down um to um and uh, right here on the um uh, main lobby and so you can see the digital ceiling for one last time and um the museum will be closing here actually that'll be just closed one minute i guess ago and um so we saw the three themes um god said let there be light woven pomegranate branches leaves and trees you're engrafted in the vine and everything in the world declares the glory of god and um, the three main theme three main floors the impact floor saying is the bible good the story floor saying what is the bible and the history floor saying is it true prove it to me show me the artifacts and the evidence and then um the three main themes of each floor so impact floor um impact the bible in america the world and now the story floor the old testament the new testament and the world of jesus of nazareth and then the history floor um dave stotts drives around a jeep and then the three thousand year old chronological walk through the bible and then chronological finishing with uh the crescendo illuminations which is bible translation so um uh, thank you for being with us and uh, i just want to say share this with other people um, so we can get it out to more people and um, I will uh, text text me if you'd like and uh, Brent if you'd stop the recording and then I can share with people that are on this phone my phone number directly um, so it's not on the recording so if you could stop.